Hi, everyone. Uh, so due to the weather, we're going to do this a little differently than uh, we had planned. Uh, we actually have a pretty decent crowd considering the blizzard-like conditions. But we're also doing a Google Hangout right now, so people are able to ask questions online. If they want to tweet at Mark LaFerriere, uh, then it's M-A-R-C-L-A-F-E-R-R-I-E-R-E. -E -E. uh, you tweet that, and I will check that on my phone and ask the questions. We have some questions on our Facebook event page. And even if you want to do the group chat on Google Chat, and as well, the people who are here, you don't have to log in. Just You can just ask questions. <laughs> just, no, no questions. Yeah. You need to log in before we... Uh, we're not like the Senate. We're actually going to take direct questions as well. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is, is just for the sake of the camera and the microphone, uh, when you ask a question, I might repeat it so that it can be heard uh, by the folks online as well. So uh, thank you for, for coming today. Uh, Nathan, this is the second time in the last year to Brantford. Uh, and we had a great response for him the last time at the Station Coffee House. And uh, he is a dynamic and interesting speaker. Now he has to Oh, be. geez. Oh, now it's set the bar. I set the oh. bar. <laughs> Actually, Nathan set the bar by being such a dynamic and engaging speaker. <laughs> so we are going to uh, get started with a few comments from Nathan. Sure. And, and I'll let Mark work out uh, his laptop here in camera angles. But I, I can't speak and sit at the same okay. time. So I've, I've got to move. I, I, I'm... Uh, my, my heritage is Irish. Uh, I was born in Toronto uh, to to uh, Irish mom, a, a Jewish father, and so moving and speaking is just what happens. I, I don't know. I, I sometimes I'll, I'll admit to something that I don't often admit to. I'll, once in a while, if I'm giving a speech in Parliament, I'll I'll kick my shoes off before I start because you can't actually see your feet on the camera, and something about being in your soft feet. If you really want to get going, uh, it's it's the way that I do it. So I've given you one of my darkest secrets. I won't do it today. It's, first of all, thank you to Mark. Thank you to all the folks that, that put this on. We've got some great uh, treats, not for people online, uh, sorry for you, but for those that are here um, from Sophia's restaurant, some nice cupcakes and stuff. Thanks for coming out in this kind of weather. It's, uh, it's, it's a day out there. And I understand the banana belt we're in here doesn't experience this often, so I appreciate everybody uh, slugging through the snow. I, I, I was actually worried Nathan might not be able to make it uh, because he was in another town. And, and lo and behold, our first meeting today, we were, we were meeting with First Nation leaders. He was there early in his car waiting. Uh, <laughs> and I just came in from 10 minutes away, and I was a little late. So I'm really glad that that's online because I've not really been early for anything in the last nine years since getting elected. Let me, before we get into the Senate and some of the questions you might have, is it good if I talk for kind of 10, 15 minutes, give you a sense of things that are going on, and then we'll, we'll dive right into it, does that seem fair? And, and we do, I, I, I love lots of questions, and, and, and the harder the better. So I, I represent northwestern British Columbia, a place called Skeena Bulkley Valley. It's the north quarter of BC. It's a riding that's about a little over 300,000 square kilometers, which is a little larger than Poland if you're playing along at home. Literally, it's massive. And beautiful and stunning. Uh, it rubs up against the Alaska border and Yukon in the far northwest. And we, um, it's been making the news a little bit in my part of the world because we're, we're a lot about pipelines right now. There's a lot of uh, proposals for moving energy from the oil sands in Alberta and natural gas out to the west coast and then presumably on to China and Asia. The process hasn't been great so far. There's been a lot of controversy, a lot of First Nations issues and rights and title and all that kind of coming up. And what's interesting about it for me is that it's uh, talking about our future. What kind of economy we're going to have? What kind of country we're going to live in? Are we going to go back to just being what we used to say uh, the, the hewers of wood and jars of water? Do we just are we a country that just simply exports everything out raw, or do we actually do something with it? Do we manufacture? This community has had a long and proud history of making things, doing things that add value to what we have. That hasn't been the tradition in a lot of parts of Ontario in the last 50 years. That's a problem for me. We've been exporting manufacturing jobs like they're going out of the side. And government, the governments we've had, I don't know what to do with that's, that's potentially going to change because in about 18 months, 12 to 18 months is the current thinking. We're going to have another federal election in Canada. And I think this is going to be a real crossroads election for us. I think we're going to see a choice being made. And there's going to be some very clear alternatives for what people have to choose on. We, the New Democrats have gone through an incredible amount in the last number of years. We had a huge and surprising breakthrough to many in Quebec and across the country. But 101 MPs into the House became the official opposition. 
and almost immediately afterwards lost our leader, the, the fellow that had brought us so long. We were then thrust into a leadership race, chose a new leader who in the last eight, nine months has had his coming out celebration in his ability to cross-examine the Prime Minister, particularly on what's gone on in the Senate. With Mike Duffy, who I found out today has visited your town. Very exciting. The, the, the scandal that folks are trying to understand, what does it mean when the Senate has been uh, stealing money, uh, using money inappropriately? You may have experienced it. This is exciting. Where senators have been flying around this country, well, actually, for 80, 100 years on the public dime, and primarily raising money for their parties. This, this has been one of the worst kept secrets around the Hill, is that when you become a senator, particularly if what you became a senator for is your fundraising capacity, that's what you continue to do. You are a paid fundraiser for the party, so that's what they do. They fly around, they have five staff that you also pay for, that support them in fundraising for political parties. And there are those of us, the Democrats, think that's wrong. So for, well, since the inception of our party, we thought the Senate was a bad thing to have around because it's undemocratic fundamentally. Nobody elects these folks. They're accountable to nobody. And now under investigation. We have RCP investigations, the Auditor General, everybody's now looking at what's going on. I, I want to try a little experiment with you guys. Um, I think I may have done this one over your last event, but I'm not sure. You need your arms for this one. So if you've got a pen or books or a cup of coffee, you just need to have your hands free. Uh, I, you can ask the press, you can play along as well. So all you need to do, this is the easiest game in the whole wide world, is uh, cross your arms, hold your arms. Okay, now as you're looking, yes, presumed candidate as well, get your arms folded. And uh, technical director. Technical director. So as your arms are folded, I want you to just look, and for those online playing, look at the arms, uh, at how they're situated, your arms. Uh, which one sort of goes up and which one goes down? Follow me. which hand is popping up if the hand's popping up. Just know that. Don't look at others because you'll only confuse yourself. Uh, let those go. Drop that down. So that's great. You did a wonderful job. Now I'd like you to fold your arms again, uh, but this time do it the opposite way. So whichever hand was up goes down. And, yeah, take your time. Can we make it a Take your time with it. Don't, don't, don't hurt. Don't hurt yourself. We've got no insurance for today. We don't have any coverage. Okay, everyone feel good? Good? Okay, drop that. That was great. I'd like to do it that way one more time. The, the weird way, the one you just did. Last time. Promise. Promise. Good. Good. Very good. This is, this is the advanced class. Good. Thank you. Now, when I first asked you, when the very first time I asked you to fold your arms, uh, what went through your head? Nothing. Nothing. Fold your arms, fold your arms. You did it. How did it feel? How did it feel when your arms were folded the very first time? Normal, natural, comfortable? Yeah, of course. When I asked you to fold your arms the second way, the, the, for the second time, what went through your minds? Anything? I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out. So the, the, the mind got you engaged a little. How did how did it feel? Did, how did it feel to do? Felt awkward. Felt awkward. Uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a little odd, right? It doesn't feel like the way you do this. There is there is a an experiment done at the UCLA in California with psych students. And they made them do this. You know, you know there's, if you've ever been to a college or university, there's sometimes ads that say, we'll pay you 10 bucks an hour to come in for a psych experiment, and de desperate students will go get the 10 bucks an hour. And so they did this for three hours, switching and changing and, and holding their arms in different ways. What, what do you think happened, aside from huge frustration over those three hours? People got used to it. When the students left, they couldn't remember. The majority, the vast majority, couldn't remember which way they, which way they started. Something that they've done. How many times have you folded your arms? A million times. Almost, well, virtually always the same way. The reason we do this goofy little test is to talk about change. How change happens for people. Because when we ask people in polling, and polling companies do this a lot, are you in favor of change as an idea? Do you believe change is necessary in the world, or that change is a good thing? Canadians overwhelmingly say yes, because they think they're supposed to say yes. Because change is a part of life, right? Some days it's like this, and some days it's like that. And those that can adapt do well. And if you can adapt to change, you tend to do poorly. But we don't like change. It feels uncomfortable. It feels awkward. But over time, 
with practice, it can become quite natural. Or at least be aware of the options that you have. So you're going to, at some point in the next week or so, you're going to be standing somewhere waiting for a bus or something. You're going to fold your arms the same old way. And then very deceptively, you're going to fold it the other way and perform like a little act of, you know, liberation. And no one else is going to know what you're doing it. And you get a little smile creep on your face. You go, yeah, I'm a pretty radical kind of person. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm, I'm good with change. I can, I can change with the times. When we talk about things like changing the government, electing an NDP government for the first time in Canadian history, for, for a number of Canadians, that could be an awkward, unusual thing to think about and wonder if it's even possible or good. We talk about getting rid of the Senate. A lot of people say, well, it's been here since the beginning. We can't really change that. And I say, well, that's worth $100 million bucks a year, that change. Well, you could put up with a little bit of discomfort for a moment. And then, what would, any, any ideas of what we could spend $100 million on every year, other than the Senate? Canada's action plan ads. Canada action plan ads. Oh, yeah, we, we, we could cut both. You know what the current figure is on those ads that come on during the hockey game? You know, you know what your taxpayer dollars have spent so far? They don't have a guess. 130? 120 million? We just got up to $512 million. We've spent, what is it, $2.5 million on that jobs program? <laughs> that doesn't exist. So we're spending ads. Oh, we're about to spend another $22 million on ads for oil companies. Because they need that. Because, you know, Shell's on hard times. <laughs> the profits for Chevron just haven't been what they, you know, it's just it's tough being an oil company because the money's just not what it used to be. This is where the government's priorities have been. Right? Continuing to dump money into the Senate. Spending money on ads that don't tell you anything or for programs that don't exist, or to help out friends in the oil patch that hardly need help. All the while saying, we don't have money to properly educate our kids. We don't have money to pay for the healthcare services that Canadians need. We don't have money for the infrastructure that cities are calling out for for years. We have a $52 billion infrastructure deficit in this country, according to the Canadian Federation of Municipalities. $52 billion. $52 billion on the books today. If we started today, and if anybody who's ever done a renovation in your home, you know, the, the roof's got to be changed. Every year you wait, it doesn't get cheaper. It gets more expensive. Because when the roof starts to leak and then damages the wall and then goes into the basement, whatever the price tag was first year isn't the same price tag in year three. We know this is a fact. This stuff's not going to get cheaper. So when we talk about the Senate, it's become, even though it's a 50-year position for our party, it's become somewhat more uh, important because of what's happened and just how egregious it's gone. Where we, does everyone, everyone's followed the story, more or less, with Duffy and the right. You know, let, me, let me give you the Cole's notes. Spending money illegally, taking money that you're not owed. Mike Duffy claimed to live one. A bunch of senators did, liberals and conservatives, said, oh, I, I don't live in Ottawa. And the rules in the Senate, this is how tough and stringent the rules were. If you walked in as a senator to the finance department and said, I need money for my housing, and they said, how much? And you said, well, give me the max, which was $22,000 a year, and they cut you a check for $22,000. <laughs> no receipts, no proof. You just said, ah, I, I rent a place, or I, I live in wherever, and they gave you money. Well, that's been going on for a long time. You take trips like Pamela Wallen did to board <coughs> meetings and say, well, I'm doing Canadian's business. One of the boards she sat on was Porter Air. She was using your money to fly to board meetings for Porter Air on Air Canada and, and sticking you with the bill. A certain level of arrogance in that, which is just stupefying. Mike Duffy gets caught because someone finds out that he's never applied for a health care card in Prince Edward Island. An intrepid reporter asking those intrepid questions. And it suddenly rolls into the fact that he's owing a bunch of money. Conservatives thought it was $32,000. So the head of the Conservative Party Fund, who's also a senator, by the way. And, and when he talks, I was at the Conservative Convention in Calgary this year. He says, when he gets up, he was the last speaker at the convention, Senator Gerstein says, I am a bag man. I am a party hack bag man. That's me. Don't proud. And the whole while I'm sitting there saying, and we pay for you. We pay for you to be the bag man. He's a billionaire, so he hardly needs the money. But we pay him the money anyway. 
they think it's thirty thousand bucks, they're gonna pay cut Mike Tucky a check from money that they raised from good loyal conservatives, which I'm sure is why they donated to Conservative Party. Regardless, the money suddenly goes to ninety thousand. Nigel Wright steps in and says, "Well, the party no longer wants to cover the funds, and it looks like we don't know. The police are still investigating that the Conservative Party were going to funnel the money through Wright. Wright was going to have the check to Duffy. Problem goes away. Pay back the Senate. Pay back the taxpayer. No more issues." That comes to light because whenever you're doing a, the best conspiracies are one in which no one will ever tell the truth because it will implicate themselves. That's how conspiracies work, right? Is that we're both in cahoots here. We've both done real bad things, but neither of us will ever say it publicly because you'd have to bring yourself down in order to do it. Well, I guess Mike Duffy made a decision at some point where there was no further down to go. Decided to open it all up and let it all out. And like a good reporter, which he was for many years, he took notes with every conversation he had, every single one. He'd go home and write notes about it. So that's what's happened. It's gone right into the Prime Minister's office. Garrison Peer investigating. Let's see more of it. This is bad. This is why people don't vote. Right? This is why people don't engage in politics, because they see such a cynical view of what happens for us as Canadians. When you, when you look up and you see this kind of scene, we need to change that. We need people to vote for something, not simply against something. That's what we're engaged in. We want to, we, we want to be on doorsteps talking to people about what they want to see in Brand, Brantford. Not, not because of all the darkness and the cynicism. Just kick the bombs out, which is fine, too. But it's also nice to vote for something. Vote for some kind of change. We do something about manufacturing jobs. We do something about healthcare transfer. We do something about reinvesting in our cities and communities and the infrastructure that we need. We've got some issues coming up for our economy over the next little while. We're going to see a budget probably in about four or six weeks federal. It's $280 billion, give or take. The conservatives are obsessed about getting the balance books and they don't care how they do it. Their biggest trick in the last three years is allocating money to different agencies, Environment Canada, Industry Canada, saying this is the budget for the year, and then telling all of their deputy ministers to not spend 30% of the budget. Just don't spend it. Promising things and just not delivering. Ask the military how it's been going and buying ships and helicopters and planes. You allocate the money and you just don't spend the money, either out of incompetence or because you don't want to. That's how the books are being balanced right now, in large part. $10 billion sitting on the books that just weren't used from last year's budget. So, we've seen the highest rate of household debt in Canadian history. Canadians owe more money compared to what we earn than Americans do. And more money is owed by Canadians than ever has been owed by Canadians. That's a significant thing. Because as those credit card bills come in, as the electricity bills and everything else come in, and they keep rising, and our incomes don't, which have been flat since 1982 for the middle class, that's a problem. That, that equation eventually comes to the choke point. We've also seen what's called our trade deficit. How much we're taking in versus how much we sell to other countries is at an historical high. We have a trade, what they call an imbalance, higher than Canada's ever seen. And we're now seeing the dollar start to get depressed. So our purchasing power, the value we get for our resources, which is all we seem to sell these days, is also dropping. <coughs> what we get for our oil and our trees and our mines, also dropping. You put those three things together in a government that doesn't like to involve itself in what happens in our economy, you have trouble. You have significant funded foundational trouble. So that's what that's. that's the next year, the next 18 months. And the question that comes to a lot of us is what kind of government do you want to elect? What kind of representation do you want? Somebody that you never see much of, and I had to look up your MP today. Um, I've been in the House a bunch, and I engage with lots of liberals, conservatives, and Democrats, certainly. Uh, or do you want somebody who's out knocking on the door showing up to the next? You've got a guy here that's incredible and one of the hardest working candidates that I've ever seen. And maybe a candidate again, and all, all those things. I want to speak for, for telling. But mostly I wanted to come in and say hello. Find out what's on your minds. Find out what things you want to think about the Senate or any other issue that's going on today. And thank you for the warm welcome and the gluten-free cupcakes. Because <laughs> I travel a lot, you know, and gluten sometimes is a bit of a problem. I'm coming back to Brantford. You guys have got a lovely bakery here. And you've got amazing cupcakes. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for coming out and embracing this Canadian, proper Canadian winter day. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Yeah, let's get you back here. Yeah, let's get you back here just for the folks there. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. Yeah. I'm talk while not moving. I, I apologize. You can move your hands, gesticulate okay, as much as you'd like. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up first to people who actually arrive in this frigid temperature. Uh, but we have a, a bunch of questions that are being asked online right now as well, which is kind of neat. And we have viewers online. So, um, so let's go first uh, from the live audience. Who has what? I, I know some of you asked questions on Twitter and Facebook uh, earlier this week, but questions, comments? I, mean, I guess my question is, yeah, it's been, it's one of the issues for all of us, going back to the national and the Yes. Yeah, right at the center. What the party's research, man, I mean, the, uh, just the, um, the, the legal and the political ramifications are actually accomplishing that. Let's zoom, for instance, and do government reflection. Uh, it, does, it does take the unanimous consent of the provinces, whether they consent or not. There's been like, so sort of a sure. research So I'm just going to repeat for the people watching online. Uh, David asked if uh, what would be the political uh, and legal ramifications of abolishing the Senate, and what are the legal requirements, essentially? Yeah. 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 So the Conservatives had promised to bring in a bill on Senate reform. It's a, it's a, but haven't done it. Um, it's a funny thing because in the House, when we're debating and asking questions about this, the Conservatives keep saying the NDP is blocking our Senate reform, blocking our bill. I'm the House leader for the official opposition. I know what's in front of the House. There's no such bill. It doesn't exist. So what they did is they punted it up to the Supreme Court, which is does two things. It gets you an opinion from our court. It also kicks the can down the road a long way in some cases. We don't know what the court's going to say, but there's probably two options. One is the one you talked about, which is unanimous consent of all the provinces. The second one is the 750 rule, which says for that kind of constitutional change, because the Senate is actually embedded in our Constitution, like a tick, you've got to get out. The, not to be too graphic about it, the, uh, the 750 says that seven provinces representing 50% of the population or more is, an, is a threshold enough to make the change. What I see politically, it would be passing strange if not straight out dangerous for a premier right now to say, I defend the Senate, I defend the status quo, I think we, the Senate is good value for money. The implications for a sitting premier to say that if they ever want to get elected again is a bit difficult because it just sounds like that old boys club thing again. Name, let's, let's name some Ontario senators. You have a bunch. No, you have a lot. Yeah, name one. Frank Mahalich. And why do you know Frank Mahalich? Because he was a Toronto Maple Leaf. <laughs> he was my dad's hero too. But, you know, Mr. Mahovlich is a very nice person, and there are nice people in the Senate, of course, except for those that we can name because of their hockey careers, <laughs> and those that have become infamous through stealing money. It's really difficult to name a sitting senator, and it's even more difficult to name anything that a senator has ever done for you. Well, I can name another one. He's a scholar. Wow, you are a... Elevated to open up you have a degree in history or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so to your question, um, every province that's ever had a Senate, and, and, and many of the provinces like Ontario had an upper chamber, got rid of them. And no province has ever suggested getting them back. There are ways to do this. We've done great things in this country. There's a way to certainly get rid of something that does nothing for Canadians, costs a bunch of money. When I first became aware of the Senate sitting as a parliamentarian, was when we had passed the only climate change bill to ever pass through the House of Commons. And there's only been one. And Jack Layton was its sponsor. The Senate, over a 22-minute debate one morning, killed it. That's it. The Conservatives looked in. They walked in one morning, realized there weren't many other senators around, introduced the bill. 22 minutes later, it was dead. What have we done on climate change since? Nothing. Oh, and that radical bill, by the way, was going to ask the Canadian government every five years to tell Canadians what we've done to reduce greenhouse gases and tell Canadians what the next five-year plan was. That's all it said. Conservatives voted against it. Conservatives killed it in the Senate. We have a bill on transgender rights sitting in the Senate, dying, going nowhere, because senators don't want to debate it. Passed, passed by the House of Commons, voted by in favor of conservatives even. So you sit and you say, I imagine, here's a scenario I worry about. Imagine a democratic government. 
passing legislation through the House of Commons, but a Stephen Harper-controlled Senate denying those bills coming into law. Bills to help out seniors, bills to build infrastructure, bills to do things for Canadians. What do we do then? Tell me any Premier in this country that says, no, it's good that we have that Senate blocking the democratically elected people of this country trying to get things done. That's a scenario I worry about. We're going to go to a question from online. This is from Cody W. Grote. Uh, if abolishing the Senate wasn't possible, what would be your ideal reform? I think you could starve them to death. I don't mean literally. I, I, you know, I, I think uh, if, if this were a volunteer position, we'll see who's truly dedicated to public service. Um, certainly limiting, as I just talked about, their ability to block legislation so that, that the, the elected house of this country could still do its job on behalf of Canadians. I think that's something that would give me some peace of mind. If it didn't cost us money and they didn't do any damage, do no harm should be the policy in the Senate, then you could, you could just allow them to be in that room down, the, down Parliament, that red chamber, which I think would make a great affordable childcare space myself. But regardless, it's, a, it's the Senate right now. I've I got all sorts of ideas of what we could do with that room. Um, but the idea of just reducing the amount of damage that they do, I think would be very helpful because they can do a lot of damage, folks. It, it, is, it is incredible the power that they were given in our Constitution. Remember what they were there for, right? It was to protect the crown from the masses, from the commons. That's us. Our, our, any historians in the room will know this, that you have to own land, you have to have certain requirements. That's why. They're there. It's to protect the crown. Okay, we have a question from the audience, uh, Randy. Hi. Randy Shelves. Hi. Wonderful. We have this debate on, online or this discussion on that. Um, and I've always felt that the grounds that we change the structure of the Senate more by nominating based on um, party representation or, or, or the overall vote. For instance, um, 6% of the Greens received both right. received by the Greens for 6%. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Senate position is Green Party members and then distributed accordingly right. according to some reasonable formula. And you can actually do that tomorrow. No need for constitutional change, no need for any debate whatsoever to change the basic plans. But it says to this government that they will not do that, and they will not even consider that of cynical and partisan they are. And, and therefore, I support the NTP's position in abolishing the Senate because it's the only reasonable course of action. If you're going to have the same sort of thing over and over again between the liberals and the going on for 90 years. No, I think as frustrated as I am or, or you might be about what's happening in the Senate, I can tell you the group of Canadians who are even more frustrated are conservative voters. Because when, if, imagine yourself, if, if those in the room have ever voted conservative or voted conservative in the last election, one of the things that you were hoping to correct and improve in Canada was clean politics and accountability because conservatives ran on cleaning up Ottawa after the sponsorship scandal and all the things that the Liberals had done when they were in power. That was their pitch. The first bill, do you know the, the name of the first bill Mr. Harper introduced as Prime Minister? The Accountability Act. We worked with them on it. That was, that was their first legislation. It was a minority parliament to make parliament more accountable, to make the function. So to your question, is that what you're suggesting is uh, for proportional representation, right? That it would, it would more reflect the actual vote when you make the Senate the body that does that. I'm not a, a, a legal expert in terms of the mechanisms to get that done. Um, the reason Mr. Harper won't do it is it would countermand his power. And I know one thing about this Prime Minister is he likes power and he likes it to be pretty unilateral. He's not into the power where you share. He's not into that sort of Jack Layton, Tom Mulcair vision of power in which you collaborate and work with other sides. It's been the NDP tradition for well, 50 years. We got together and worked with people. Um, the idea that you give the Senate more authority, an authority that wasn't controlled by Mr. Harper, uh, no way. <laughs> He's not going to do it. In terms of an idea, I'm, I'm at that point, like my friend, where you looked at reform and you just see the lack of progress from a party that got elected in on a reform mandate. And at some point, Canadians, even those that voted conservative, say, forget it. Let's just get rid of it. Because the, the tinkering at it, just 
has got, gotten what we've got Mike Duffy. We've got Pam Wall and Patrick Brazil. That's what that's what we have. Well, and, the, and the question I ask all the time is, uh, can you tell me one thing the Senate did this year that's worth ninety million dollars? Can you tell me uh, one thing in the last ten years that the Senate did that's worth nine hundred million dollars? If you can do that, then let's have that conversation. But yeah. Right. So, so just for the folks online, uh, Roy's question was, do you feel that the Senate is currently restricting the government's agenda? Okay. Other than uh, because it seems like senators keep stealing money, that seems to restrict the conservative agenda because they get caught up in this. Right? Because Mr. Harper has appointed everybody who's been involved in these scandals, that, that undermines his ability to do things because of scandal. In terms of blocking conservative legislation or changing it or reforming it, I, I can't think of a single conservative bill, except for one that was going after unions, where an old progressive conservative senator, Hugh Siegel, who's retiring, who's fed up with the whole thing, actually made some changes because the bill was unconstitutional. You think that would matter to a sitting government that they're writing laws that don't pass the Charter of Rights, you know? It, but it doesn't. The conservatives introduce bills all the time that they know are illegal. Anyways, except for that one piece of legislation, I can't think of anything that the conservatives have wanted to do that's been stopped by the Senate, other than getting into trouble, which is the Senate seems to be pretty good at. So we have a question online from James, James Messaker. Uh, it's sort of a, a comment that there's a question in here, though. Quote, is the Senate broken because no one in the Senate owns an orange t-shirt? Uh, I think a much better way to reform the Senate is to remove parties from the Senate altogether, appoint citizens of stature from business, arts, science, academia for 10-year non-renewable staggered terms, appointed by Crown, not on the advice of the PM, but an all-party committee or ideally a provincial all-party committee. What are your thoughts on this? Wow, I've not uh, heard of that before. I guess that, that I'm a Democrat. I'm a new Democrat. I, if I'm doing something that's not right, there's a natural consequence that happens every couple of years in which the voters that I represent say, we're getting rid of you. You did the wrong thing. You didn't work hard or you did something we don't agree with. Anytime you have a, a position that doesn't have that accountability back to humans at some place, then you run the risk of good people turning bad. And I think that happens. I think it's a, it seems to be a natural human condition that you can give it enough time and a bunch of money and some power and no accountability back, you run the risk. You always run the risk. I just don't think anybody who wasn't elected should ever be able to stop or pass laws. I really believe in that, that fundamental connection that when you're rewriting Canadian law or making new ones, your mandate should come from people who voted. I just, I just I believe it in my core. So the reforms that people talk about, I, I think they're innovative and they're trying to get at something to make a bad situation, a very bad situation better. Um, I think it gets into your constitutional questions. And, and, and then setting up a system that's foolproof and not going to be tampered with by partisan interests. And when I've, I've worked around Ottawa a long time. It's, if they say it's, the, it's like water on sidewalk, it just finds its way through the cracks. And those, those partisan uh, interests always seem to rise up. So I guess I'm a little skeptical on those things. But the, the clean thing is the, the clean shot, which is to just end, end it. But before we get to Kevin's question, I have a question uh, that I've, I've heard come up here and there. Um, when we talk about representation of the provinces, uh, yeah. the Senate's idea is to be representative, even though most people don't know who their senators are unless they're in trouble. Yeah. Um, and not the people are in trouble. Senators are in trouble, ironically. Uh, one of the things that I wonder is, I mean, municipalities don't have a Senate. They have bodies that help um, uh, push policy that they think is, is good. Yeah. Um, is it possible, as some premiers have said, for the provinces to, to do that job in a way the provincial governments to yeah. advocate properly for the provinces? So there's, there's the power dynamic that comes under this. So really, you're going to get a lot of resistance to those ideas where the Senate becomes more legitimate um, from the premiers of this country. Because when the Premier of Ontario or New Brunswick gets to a microphone and says, this is what people in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia or Ontario want, they speak with some authority. No one's going to say, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe you don't speak for Ontario or BC right now. If you make the Senate more powerful and more representative of the provinces, it becomes a counterweight. 
the premium. So you're going to see a lot of resistance to some of the ideas that, that were talked about here in terms of elevating the Senate to a more powerful place where it gives them more legitimacy. And the resistance you're going to see is from the provinces, from the premiers. They're going to say, I've got the voice. I, I represent the voice of Newfoundland when I go to Ottawa right now. If you diminish my voice as a premier, I'm going to resist because that's the system that we've built over the years. Because currently the, the premiers of, what is it, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, the former Ontario premier uh, said we should abolish the Senate. But this isn't, uh, I, I think, some of the territories. Uh, yeah, it goes across party lines, which is right. interesting. That's when you get into that good spot in politics, when you see the same position being advocated from people who don't agree on anything else. <laughs> right? That's, that's when you get the sweet spot, right? When, when you get more uh, very conservative premiers like Brad Wall, and then you get... Uh, more progressive premiers like we have in, in Manitoba advocating the exact same position. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, they're politicians too. They see the, the way the, the weather vane is pointed. And it's just, how do, you, how do you get up in front of taxpayers and say, this is a great institution. I love those guys. They're fantastic. You know, it's in these days where we're cutting budgets everywhere, it's just really, really hard to justify why Pam Wallen is getting a paycheck from you and I. Uh, we have a question from Kevin. Uh, so, uh, so Kevin's yeah. question is, does the criticism around unelected bodies uh, not being able to tinker with laws also apply to the Supreme Court? I, I really like our Supreme Court. I, I like one thing. Uh, here's where I'll, I'll give Mr. Harper some credit, because I've been critical today. Um, I assume, you know how in the States the, the appointment of judges is an incredibly political event? that they go back through their garbage and their records and everything and try to attack them and it's Republican versus Democrat and judges have got party affiliation. We don't have that in Canada. Where the judiciary, our judges, are to the side of the political conversation. Generally speaking, I don't, I don't know how the Supreme Court judges vote when it comes to an election. I like that. I don't think they should be partisan. Our judges don't make laws. Some, some conservatives talk about a so-called activist bench. That's language borrowed from the Republicans in the States. What our judges do is hold up the Constitution, hold up the Charter, and when asked, passed by Canadians through the courts, does such a bill or such a law respect our Charter rights? The court will rule on that. They did that recently on prostitution. So a, a question is put to them through the courts, and a question around public safety. Do the current prostitution laws protect women in particular, and the courts looked at the evidence and said no, but then turned back to Parliament and said you have to fix it. Your current laws on the books have to be fixed. I think that's an appropriate role. They don't come in and say, here's the bill, Parliament, you have to pass this bill, we're the, we're the Supreme Court justice. So I think our system works well, and to this point, I'd say for the most part, Mr. Harper has not chosen the partisan route of appointing hyper-conservative judges to the bench, like happens in the states, where whoever's president tries to get as many of their kind of judges on the on the judge uh, on the panel as possible. We have a question online from Randy Roberts. Without the Senate, who would be the sober second thought, and how would each province slash territory be equally represented? Okay, so the provinces and territories are not equally represented right now at all in our Senate. Right? It doesn't. It's not based on population. It's just based on history. BC, the province I come from, has been growing as has Alberta, but our representation from senators, who we also can't name. Don't feel bad about that, by the way. When I ask BC audiences to name a single BC senator, except for there's a skier. We have a famous skier who got into Senate sports. Eh? Um, in, in terms of, um, the, the question was, was more about provinces' representation and, and the health of our democracy. I just, I looked at the provincial examples, and democracy didn't take a step backwards when they got rid of the Senate in the province. It, it just really didn't. And again, that's not one party or another. That's, that's unanimously agreed to. If you went to the Premier of Ontario or any of the candidates in the next provincial election and said, who's in favor of bringing back the Senate for Ontario to have that sober second thought? I, from Kudak to Horvath, no one's going to say, yeah, go Ontario Senate. So in terms of that affecting the government and being sober about things, in the nine years I've been up there, I've seen one bill that got changed positively by the Senate. And it was a small technical flaw that had come through the legislation that we hadn't caught on the House side because you know, we have lawyers too. And the Senate caught it and they changed the bill and we were happy for it. But seriously, one change over $900 million in nine years, not so good. 
Not not good value for money. We can there's other ways that we do that. Comments from the gallery. Questions. You know the other one. That's right. Yes, right. We have we have a proposal. Um, because given it's kind of it's not forming the path that we want to see. Doesn't provide the time. Yeah. So if you have a proposal for an activism or a body that we provide that. So the question is, do we can, can we invent another body to allow sober second thought? I, the sober second thought thing, I've always pondered a little bit. You know, democracy is a rough and tumble sport. Here, it, it's quite simple, right? You, you have a candidate who runs on a platform, a bunch of promises. If they win at the polls, then that's what we call a mandate. You take those promises and you try to make them into reality. If some of those things that you're doing are not good, again, the very natural consequence of that is, is that you don't get to do it again. You get unelected. In terms of the, the sobriety, the so-called soberness of the Senate, it would be good if they were sober. I think it would be good also if, if there was a way that you could, you could counter that power. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm for democratic reform of the way we vote. I don't, I don't really love our voting system right now. Yeah, so the, the mechanism piece is that when, when people vote, two things I think need to happen. One is you need to have good confidence that your vote is going to be reflected in the government and the parliament that gets formed. A lot of Canadians don't feel that way right now. And I think a lot of Canadians who don't vote, if you ask them why not, is they say, well, it doesn't matter. I live in a conservative riding. I live in a liberal riding. I live in a new democratic riding. And I don't vote that way. And so my vote doesn't feel like it matters. I think every vote should count. I also think that in reforming the system, having a voting system that's clear and understandable and easy to see the results, you would likely lead to more coalition, more cooperative governments, which I also think is a good thing. I'm a proud New Democrat. I think we've got the best ideas on offer. I also know we're not perfect. I also know that some of the best ideas that have ever come out of Canadian parliaments have been when parties have been forced to work together. right? Just to get, when Paul Martin had to work with Jack Layton to get the budget through, we took a four and a half billion dollar corporate tax cut that was unnecessary and moved it over into housing and the environment and infrastructure. And ironically, this is a fun little note of Canadian history, a bunch of the housing money, by the time it worked its way through the system and was actually spent and announced, the Conservatives were in power and went out and cut the ribbon on all these affordable housing units all over the country and took credit for it, a budget they had voted against, of course. An idea that they don't believe in. My point is this, is that if you have a mechanism that allows more cooperative nature, which I think is a Canadian value, to try to find consensus, I don't think Canadians are inherently partisan. I think this room might be a little more partisan than most, but most Canadians didn't wake up this morning worried about Stephen Harper or Tom Mulcair or how the parties were faring. Most people worried about their heating bill. Most people worried about whether they had a job. And most people just want a government that reflects who they are and who we are as a people. I think we're a mix. So, so you're saying, to clarify, that democratic reform would be a mechanism, uh, to steal Roy's words, to help parties work together and to see more of that sober second thought because you would have more minority governments and more opportunity for parties to work together? I want every vote to count. And we have a system right now where if you and I are running against each other and I get one more than you do, then I get the power. Stephen Harper ended up with a majority government with a 38%, 39% of the electorate, which with only 60% of us voting, that's 25% of voting Canadians. 25% voted a government. How much power did they end up with? 100. Virtually 100% of the power by convincing 25% of us to vote one way or another. It just doesn't seem very democratic. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Moore and then one from Randy. Brian? Um, you came out today and you uh, presented the NDP presidential candidate. Yeah. Um, and you talked about the Canadian Party and the Canadian Party. And I've also heard a few other things that were mentioned. But in the current uh, structure in dealing with people, one of the good areas the Democrats support is the first place. Yeah. What would you need to message? We've got a couple of journalists here. Yes. But we have to rely on the media that well, I understand it's owned by either conservatives or liberals, um, and presents a liberal or conservative message. Right. Whether the Democrats are going to buy and invest in a, um, a 
So the, the question was around the, uh, the media and who owns the media, the, the, the corporate we're, owners. We're kind of doing it right now with this Google Hangout. Right? There's no editing here. If, if people want to just check us out on Google. No. Conrad Black <laughs> tried to take over the feed here today, but he, he, he failed. He owes, owes too much taxes. Um, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I, I, I think uh, for us, in terms of getting the message out, I don't really... I mean, there's moments where I, I turn on the CBC and I shake my hands at the screen and say, well, how did you report it that way? You know, a story that I'm familiar with or I read something in the paper and I think, oh, it feels biased. In general, I don't feel that way. In general, I, I, you look at the Senate scandal, it's gotten a fair amount of attention, even though if you wanted to go in your theory about who owns the media, this has been bad for the conservatives. The liberal position on the Senate is status quo. Just point more liberals and they'll be automatically more honest. It, it, that's weird. Uh, it, it just, just, just in terms of you know experience and stuff like that. Um, so my feeling with with the media, particularly the strains that have happened to the so-called traditional media, financial strains, that it's just hard to make money uh, putting out a newspaper. Uh, even television has suffered. Radio, varying experiences. The, the the challenge of social media and people getting their news in lots of different ways interactive ways that require the media as it requires politicians to be different about the way that we tell our stories. I don't think the dust is completely settled on that conversation yet. In terms of the NDP owning its own outlet, I don't think it's anywhere in any of our planning right now. I, I'm here, I'm a traditionalist. I, I really do believe in the intimacy of politics. That the way I've been successful in my little corner of the country, because I come from small communities, is it's one-to-one, -one, it's the door knocking, it's church basements, it's the community halls, it's the Tim Hortons. When, when I'm at a door, uh, we've been knock, door knocking federally in the elections, you know, 18, 12, 18 months away. We've been door knocking for the last several months. And, you know, people have a lot of opinions, people have a lot of different um, sort of uh, biases or traditionally how they vote, how they don't. But I hear a lot of, well, you're the person or you're the group at my door two years before an election. Uh, that moves a lot of votes. So I think, I think, uh, Nathan's right. Uh, shock, but I think Nathan's right. Uh, that intimacy is so important. Getting to doors and, and doing the work, not disappearing in between elections. How many times do you have candidates who lose a, an election and then hibernate for four years and then or, come back out and say, "Oh, I really care." Or win an election yeah, and, hibernate. and hibernate for four years. I mean, there's 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 a lot of experiences with this. My my feeling is that Ottawa is its, its own bubble. The press gallery, the parties, we operate in this echo chamber and talk to each other all the time about things we think are very important. The only way to, to ground truth things for me is when, you, when you're on a doorstep, when you're in halls like this and you ask people what's really on their mind. It, it, it can be a much more powerful experience. You know, the, the media can be a filter and a lens and everyone's got their opinions, but I think it's, it's only in the media's interest to report things as fairly as they can. Otherwise, the, the accusation and proven accusation of bias, if it's ever proven, to a journalist or an outlet uh, can be damaging. Unless you just you go all in, right? Like, and it was interesting watching the Toronto Sun deal with Rob Ford, right? Because they're all in on the guy, right, for years. Until the point where it gets just so bad that you just can't hold that political stance anymore. And the editors and all the rest have had to say, we supported this guy, we endorsed this guy, but it's just frighteningly embarrassing at this point. And, and I think as somebody who's, who's worked in the media and somebody who, who owns a local media outlet, um, you know, even the other outlets, I've, I've found they've been really, really fair uh, on the federal side. I can only speak to that. But I found that we get fair articles, we get fair discussions, we get equal page count or, or column count or whatever you want to call it uh, locally. I think local media is a bit of an answer as well because the more local, Brantford is so lucky. We have something like 14 local media outlets. Wow. So between radio, television, newsprint, um, and I think you know we've been treated really fairly here. Um, so maybe more local media is the answer instead of you can only have so many viewpoints if you only have so many places. So we're going to get Randy and then and then this woman here. Um, yeah, you touched very briefly on uh, lower cynicism and the perception of our election, and I wanted to state that I'm interested in lower suppression as well. These issues like the Senate, where it makes people cynical. Yeah. And then they, they, they my goal doesn't really count, or yeah. I'm not going to bother going to yeah. that. Uh, one of the things that I've done in the print time is I try to write a letter to the editor to remind people to check that little box on their income tax that says, can elections handle this information? 
comment in is, is around the idea of, of making sure that people tick the box on their income tax form that allows Elections Canada to use your information just to know that you're there. I think the I think it's an important tool. It's one of the few we have left since the census, the long form census was done away with, which was an incredibly cynical thing to do because it hurts uh, municipalities, it hurts groups that are trying to spend money effectively, it hurts us as a people trying to understand who we are and where we're going, right? What's going on, <coughs> excuse me, with income. What's, what's the racial mix in the country? How are people doing? Because if you don't measure, you can't manage. And choosing ignorance, for a government to choose to be ignorant of something, like its own people, very cynical. I, voter suppression, you want to talk about voter suppression, you look at the robocalls that happened in the last election, which is still going through the courts. So a party, the Conservatives spent money phoning, identifying the vote first, finding out who wasn't voting Conservative, Liberal and New Democrat predominantly, then phoning them day of or night before the election and sending them to the wrong polling station. Like, you, if you read about that happening in Colombia or the Congo, you'd say, oh, it's one of those banana republics that doesn't know how to have a free and fair vote. The fact that it happens in Canada is stupefying to me. And there's a bill sitting in the Conservatives' hands to make that fully legal and never allow it again, and they won't bring it for debate or a vote in the House. The minister for 12 months now, when we ask questions about that, has said the bill will be coming in due course. He says the same thing every single time. When are you going to present your bill? You've been promising in due course, in due course, in due course. It's, that's what leads to cynicism. As you go and you want to exercise your democratic right, and you get a phone call from Elections Canada supposedly saying your voting poll has been moved, you drive across town, you get there, you stand in line, you go to vote, and they say, sorry, you're at the wrong station. We want to change the law so it doesn't matter which polling station you go to. You should be able to vote as a Canadian, whether you're at the right one or the wrong one. If they can identify you are who you are, and you happen to be traveling, you're in Toronto for the day, you should be able to vote. We shouldn't make it hard for people to vote. We should make it easy for them to vote. Okay, question here. Yeah, no, yeah. Th there's been a definite uh, additional uh, pieces about more care. Hey, I've, I've watched Question Period for a long time, <laughs> since before I got elected. I've, I've never seen the kind of question period uh, it, that we've seen in the last eight months. But Tom, just like a focused lawyer, just taking the story apart one by one, day after day. And you're getting a pretty broad spectrum of people who comment on these things, from conservative to not so much giving him, I think, proper credit for when it. Joe, when Joe Clark is saying that Tom Mulcair is the best opposition leader he's seen in at least two decades, I mean, that's really saying something from a progressive conservative. Yeah, and so a big part of what's happening next for us, just so people understand, is that I think the job that we have as official opposition is holding the government to account. That's the first line of the job description. Hold the government of the day to account for what they're doing. Tick. Tom's been doing a great job on that. So is this amazing team. The second piece of the job is getting out to Canadians and telling your story and hearing from them. And that's the second piece that's happening for Tom over the last little bit, and that'll be a lot of the focus in the next year and a half. Yeah, we've been lucky. We've had Tom here for, I think, seven or eight events. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, since uh, since leadership campaign, and he's been excellent. Packed houses and people leaving saying, I've never learned so much at one of these political meetings. No, or, the guy you is know. incredibly smart. Yeah, and, and funny, and, and a lot of that's coming out. It takes time. You know, it takes time to get known, especially in the whole country. My dad lives in Quebec, and he always says, well, you, you'll be fine with Mulcair because, you know, I live in Quebec, and everybody here knows him, and we love him, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter of now the rest of the country getting to know him, and they are. He's actually got the highest approval rating of any leader right now for how he does his job. He's seen as the most prime ministerial by 44% of Canadians, and you compare that to the other leaders. That's incredible. 
uh, I really feel a lot of the same things I was feeling about a year before the orange wave, right? A really a leader that's starting to turn heads that people think could be prime minister. And except we're at a way better position than we were in the past when it comes to boots on the ground, organization. In, in the 650, how many, however you measure the, the length of your democratic existence, CCF and on back, this is the, I remember, do you remember when Jack got up in a campaign, and I think it was 06, and it was the first day of the campaign, he did a press conference and said, I'm applying for the job of prime minister. And you could hear the press gallery laugh out loud. Because it was like, come on, Jack, you know, we know you're a really optimistic guy, but seriously, you guys have got 19 seats. You're not going to be prime minister. And I remember bracing myself a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> geez, that's a pretty big throw there, Leighton. Are you, is that the first line we wanted to use? And, but Jack had this very, very clear vision of where we were going, and it was in stages, and it was in steps. A big part was going to be Quebec, and then shoring up things in southern Ontario. We can, for the first time in our party's history, stand there incredibly say, we want to form the next government in Canada. And, and the media in Ottawa don't laugh, the voters don't laugh, they say, okay, well, let's see what your plans are. That's a huge hurdle to get over, politically, is that, that hurdle of competency, and relevancy, and legitimacy to say, this is what a new Democrat government would look like, and people looking at it and saying, I can see Tom Mulcair sitting in the Prime Minister's chair, I can see him going to Washington, meeting the President, and fighting on our behalf. That's the big question for me, is who's going to fight for our... Uh, our interests. I make I make the historical appeal. If you think about it, we we as a country we've we've regretted putting certain prime ministers in office. Um, we've never regretted putting a new Democrat as prime minister, but we have sure as heck regretted not putting several new Democrats as prime minister. How many people today say I really wish we had actually elected Tommy Douglas as our prime minister? He's the greatest Canadian who ever lived. How many people say, and I've worked with that for years, how many people say Ed Broadbent should have been prime minister? Talk about the best prime minister we never had. How many people in the last several years have said, my goodness, we missed an opportunity to make Jack Layton the prime minister? And now it's too late. Well, we have that opportunity with Tom Mulcair. You know, and I've seen the same sort of thing I've seen out of Ed and out of what Derek Blackburn would talk about Tommy Douglas and about what we all saw out of Jack, out of Tom. And we have this historical opportunity we've never had before. And I think as a country, we'll regret not doing it if we don't. So I think it's a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is, we actually have the opportunity. Let's do this. Mm. Uh, Roy, you had a question. Yeah. I mean, uh, because you're uh, already talking about uh, air and how we uh, excellence in opposition. And myself, I think you know that that opposition is that place on the If you're running into opposition, I am almost certain I would go for them. It's not going to be the opposite. No. <laughs> and, and so, what I wonder is, that's the best. Uh, how do you see that transfer happening where the NDP changes the public perception of him as an excellent opposition? Roy's got a great question. Talking about how the, the perception of Tom Mulcair as opposition leader has gone up in terms of people's understanding and, and appreciation for what he does. The transition from that role to applying for the job of prime minister and saying, well, how would he be as a prime minister? There was a great interview this morning on uh, the House CBC show, and they had, uh, I think, Bruce Anderson. He sits on the ad issue panel. He just did a bunch of polling on the leaders and asked a bunch of very specific questions about what their deficits might be. On, on Harper, it was about control and honesty, and on Trudeau, it was about whether you have substance and policies, and on Mulcair, it was about sort of kind of the likability factor, and could he be prime minister? And Bruce's comments were really interesting because he said the conservative's pitch is going to be that he won't make it, he's too angry, or there's something wrong with him to be prime minister. And from his point, just this one snapshot, was that his, his uh, perception with Canadians as the resistance has softened dramatically to the idea of him sitting in that role. That the, the prime ministerialness, which is hard to achieve when you don't have the job. I'll take you back to when Stephen Harper was opposition leader. He was not very good at it. And, and I, like many Canadians, had a real hard time envisioning him being a prime minister and flying on the plane and doing that. I still, I still <laughs> struggle with it. But, but a different to, way. to his credit, in the first six months, he grew into that job quite a bit. And there's... There's nothing like being president or prime minister to make you look like a president or a prime minister. It's just it's one of those jobs that it's on the job training and performance. I think all you can say is how do you connect with Canadians? Do you understand their issues? Are you a fighter? 
because I want someone sitting in that chair that's going to go out and defend my interest every day, hard. Not, not in a passive sort of please, please kind of way, but in a serious way, an intelligent way. And I, I looked at the Prime Minister's trip to Israel last week, which felt to me like a, a political exercise from start to finish. And it had, I don't know if you followed it much, but it had that embarrassing moment where he's standing, I think he's at the Wailing Wall, I'm not sure which, where, which part of Israel he was, he was in, but there's a conservative MP who wants to get into the photo op, and he's yelling at Harper's handlers saying, come on, come on, this is the money shot, we have a re-election coming, let me in. In the money shot, and you think, is the Prime Minister out there trying to enhance Canada's position in the world, trying to push for Canada's interests, or play a positive role in the Middle East? Or is this the money shot? Is he, is he there playing domestic politics in Israel? And I, it, For Mr. Harper, he, he's got some uh, qualities, but one of the things I think that hurts him is he's just partisan and playing the game all the time. We have now entered into the constant election cycle. That's what those ads are about. No one's being fooled, right? You, you watch a game or your evening show, and it's just constant political ads with your money. They introduced a bill last session before... We had had a minute debating it in the House of Commons. The Conservatives had already sent out the fundraising letter for the legislation. That'll never pass. It's got, it's got nothing to do with changing the law. It's got everything to do with hitting the right buttons with their constituency to raise money. They, they, he just recently had a fundraising pitch on a law that was their law around light bulbs. Oh, yeah. And then somebody else in the party used it as a way to fundraise this horrible light law, and we need to change it, and please donate to my campaign. It was their law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. it doesn't, so that perpetual campaigning thing and all the rest. I guess your question is about can people see and envision Tom in that role as prime minister? And, and I think from where it was a year ago, much more so, where it'll be a year from now, we can only hope that the answer is even further yes, yeah, so that you can see him in both roles. Yeah, he's really effective in taking Harper to task, but I can also see him on the other side, which is the pushing of answers. Jack had something that he really burned into us that I, that I think Tom's taken up well. It's The role of opposition is also the role of proposition. You can be critical of government when they're doing things wrong, but if you don't come with the solutions, then all you're doing is being critical. And Canadians can't feed their families on criticism. they got to feed their families on new ideas and solutions to some of these problems that we've been facing. Right? What do you do about the manufacturing sector? How do we tackle climate change properly? How do we deal with First Nations issues? You can't get up like your MP here and say, well, we're going to try to get this treaty solved during the campaign. And then after the campaign, say, well, wait and see is the best approach for First Nations in Canada. That doesn't work. That's That's been the policy for 150 years. How are we doing? I mean, it's more expensive each, oh my each year gosh. that goes on, right? Oh, my gosh. Uh, we have a question online from uh, Rob Adlam. Uh, this isn't on Twitter. It's a little long. This is on Facebook, but let me uh, read it to you. More than 140 oh, characters. It is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Probably a thought or something. Is there any hope... <laughs> Is there any hope of reforming the Senate? I have to admit that I would lean towards trying to reform it first, but that is just it. I don't know that anyone has really ever tried to do that yet. I most sincerely disagree with the level the system has degraded to. It was fashioned after the British House of Lords, though we have no aristocracy or peerage in Canada. An elected, an elected Senate representative of all provinces and parties is at least worth a shot to me. I don't know what the Senate or senators, I don't know what senators represent me. They have never made an attempt to contact me or update me on what they are doing. They hold no local riding meetings. Thank you for doing this today, Mark and Nathan, where others won't. It's, it's a great question. It, it kind of comes back to the question of can you, can you tinker with it? Can you make it something that looks a lot better? And it, it, It's kind of like seeing you know, a, you know, an old bicycle leaning up against the wall somewhere and it's got no wheels and someone comes up and says, well, if, if, if we painted it blue, Maybe that bike would be a lot better. Put some oil on the chain. The chain would spin easier. And it's like, yeah, but there's the wheel thing. And they go, yeah, yeah, well, what about a basket? You could put a basket on the front of the bike. And that would, I think the idea is very thoughtful in this post, right? Could we have elected? There has been some attempt. In Alberta, they elected a, sort of elected a senator uh, who's since, I think he's resigned now. Um, you get 7% turnout or something voting. So there's legitimacy questions right away. Again, one thing you have to consider if you make the Senate uh, elected is you, you will consciously put two uh, positions of power. 
which a lot of people will say, oh, that's good, right? I want to I want to balance the power between the two things. And I say, yeah, that's interesting because having all the power in the prime minister's hands in a majority, we've seen what damage you can do. Only challenge is I spend a fair amount of time in Washington where there's two, really three nodes of power. The horse trading and the, the gridlock that goes on when one power is controlled by one side, another power is controlled by the other, the voters get completely forgotten in that scenario. It's just constant jockeying in that polarity. The Canadian system allows the Prime Minister a great deal of latitude and significantly more power than his equivalent in the presidential system. This goes back to my voting reform position, whereas if you had a parliament that was more representative, you would have a parliament that was often more sharing of power, just in its inherency. I'm not sure putting the power into the Senate uh, is going to be effective for what people want out at the end of the day. Do we have a question or comment in the back? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So the the, the comment uh, was was about. Yeah, yeah, and it's it, it, so the idea with, with the American situation is if you if you have two representatives and one's one way and one's the other and, and they, I mean the the, the the partisanship has gotten so severe down there that the, the Republicans in particular have brought the American economy and and in effect the global economy they're holding it hostage. While debating healthcare bills, right, it gets that ridiculous. Where relatively smart men and women get so locked into interests when you have these two or three nodes of power that they're they, they hold each other's they're, they're choking each other while drowning, and no one's willing to just let go and figure another solution out. And I think Obama, when he first came in, had some actual intent to try to reach out to the Republicans and, spend, and probably burn two years of his presidency what turned out to be mostly a waste of time because the because the reform part the reform excuse me the the other ones the tea party uh, were coming up and uh, weren't interested in talking to anybody else but yeah the, the experience with my colleagues south of the border not been great uh, I think just having a parliament that actually works and functions and represents us would be a lot better than, than tweaking it such that we end up with these intractable fights we have a question from Alex yeah. I really feel that the what if, what if, yeah? So the question is, what, what what else could we be doing? I, you know, I've got uh, two young boys. My 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 guys are three and a half. I've got twins, um, which made Christmas a hoop this year. It's like Santa was living and breathing, like it was real deal. Um, and and I, and I talk to a, a, I'm with my friends all the time, and and for young families coming up, right? It's it's tough, and depending on where you live in the country, your experience is very very different. If you're a young family trying to get into the housing market in Vancouver or Toronto, God help you, right? Like unless you're pulling in three hundred thousand bucks a year, you just you're not getting much. And I think government can't do everything, and government shouldn't do everything because it would do a bad job of it. I always said if government invented the cell phone, it'd be forty pounds, and you could walk ten feet with it. But what government did do is incentivize BlackBerry to go out and try to invent the best thing that they could. We subsidized that thing like crazy. In terms of the innovation, I think government can do two things. It can allow for innovation, and it can also set fair rules so that people have a shot at improving their lives. This generation, our generation and the one before, grew up in a way where moving up was possible, primarily through the door of education, getting trade skills, going to university, doing something that just made you smarter, gave you more opportunities than your parents had. And we made education more accessible writ large. The other thing we did, we started to talk about retirement so that people could retire in dignity. That was the idea. Both of those things, just as fundamentals, are sliding away from us. The government moved the retirement age up to from 65 to 67. 
And I can remember Stephen Harper talking about one of the conferences and said, well, it's just a couple more years working in the office. And it's like, oh, that's fantastic. So you're telling me that the people that, that knock down trees in my part of the world and work in mining, hard, hard labor jobs should do another two years at the very end of that because you think that's a great idea? The pensions are slipping away, and I think that the overall project for the government is to lower expectations, diminish expectations. You should expect less while your taxes basically stay more or less the same. That's wrong. Affordable childcare starts for me as one of the most predominant things. The second tier of things comes around the consumer interest. Tom's out on a, a cross-country tour right now. You, you've seen this pay-to-pay -pay system that some of the, the telecom companies and, and uh, your electricity bill, where if you want to get your bill, you have to pay to get your bill. Talk about adding insult to injury, right? Here's the hundred bucks you owe for heating this month. Ah, but if you want a bill, you got to pay another four dollars for us to send you a bill. The ATM fees. If I go to get my money out of my bank, why am I paying two fifty or two bucks? Why do we have interest rates in our credit cards that are, by definition, illegal? We have laws in the books in Canada that say. Banks cannot charge usurious rates. Usurious rates is the, the key. 21% on borrowing money is by every definition in our criminal code usurious. But it's just this wink and a nod to Bay Street saying, keep it going, don't worry about it. That's stuff that affects people in real terms. Uh, I have a question from a person, Herb. Uh, I would like to know why Canada does not have a gold reserve. Why Canada doesn't have a gold reserve? Well, we left it uh, quite a while ago. The idea was, the, the old gold reserve was that the amount of money that you have, you had enough, enough gold to compensate for it so that you're, in times when currencies, United States, Northeastern United States used to have 265 currencies in 1880. Just, people just made currencies, like you could just make them, and they were very local dollars. Brantford probably had a currency at one point in its history. Brantford bucks, right? The Brantford bucks, ah, yeah, very, very famous Brantford bucks. The, the idea was that to give people confidence in this paper money, because we were moving to paper, was the idea that there would be gold behind it. Uh, that got left, and it allows for more speculation, which is a big problem. The idea of going back to the gold reserve would be highly problematic. Uh, you, you, I think what we need to do is look at things like the Robinhood tax on transfers that go around. I don't think anyone's ever spending time on this, mm -hmm. but the amount of the marketplace, which we think of as, okay, you go in and an investor says, I'm going to bet on that company, invest in that company, they're going to build a plant, and they're going to return something back to you. That's how it started. 99, 98% of the market that goes on right now is purely on instant speculation. I think the yen's going down tomorrow. You dump money in, you pull it back out six minutes later. It doesn't actually produce a lot of economy. One way to talk about, and the Europeans are looking at this more seriously, is to put an incredibly small tax, 0.001% or so, on every trade, which doesn't affect the trade. If you're going to invest into Ford, you're going to invest in Ford, whether there's a 0.001% tax or not. But what it stops is the speculators, because their margins are incredibly small. They just do huge volumes. They'll buy $5 million worth of T-bonds and then dump them right away if they can make a very, very small margin on it because the profit that comes up with them. So uh, the gold reserve has not been something that a lot of us are looking at. Although, last comment, the finance minister a couple weeks ago got up and said, you know, a, a lower Canadian dollar would be a great thing. Finance ministers have never, ever talked about things that are the purview of the Bank of Canada, the governor of the Bank of Canada. He's independent for a good reason. Otherwise, the governor starts playing politics. Well, lo and behold, now the governor has come out and talked about interest rates and lending rates in such a way to keep the dollar lower. It's about 92, 93 cents and maybe drive it back down to 80 cents or less. Clarity has been running really fast and loose with his job, and it worries me because whether you're right wing or left wing, there are some good principles we have, and one of them is that our central bank isn't politicized so that a party, for electoral reasons, suddenly changes our lending rate. That's, you want to talk about playing with fire? That's playing with fire. And Clarity is walking right to that line, and I would argue even over it right now. So we're going to have to wrap up uh, momentarily. Um, Nathan's got to get to London in this uh, snowstorm. Um, for some, some other events, but uh, I, I just want to say a little something, and then Nathan will say a little something. Um, when I think about the Senate, I think about a story um, I heard from Derek Walker. Uh, Becca and I were uh, with him and his wife, Monique, uh, and he still has his, uh, uh, like, a parking spot at Parliament Hill. So he said, when you're in Ottawa, let's let's go have lunch at the parliamentary uh, restaurant, I guess for lack of a better term. 
And uh, he was shocked because he was able to sit where the Prime Minister used to sit. And he was like, I was a new Democrat in the 80s. I had to sit like way back here. Um, <laughs> so he was really happy about that. Uh, but uh, the ladies went for a little bit of a walk and we were looking at different uh, the, prime, the Prime Minister portraits. And it was just him and I and, and he was looking at the Brian Mulroney portrait and that was during his time. And he talked about when he was retiring, um, he went and talked to Brian and Brian said, I'd like to appoint you to something. You've been a really excellent MP. They always got along for, for whatever reason. And he offered him a position on the Senate as a new Democrat. And Derek said something very interesting. Um, he didn't take the position because it, it wasn't something he believed in. But he said, you know, looking back, I almost wish I had taken it just to be the senator saying, this is useless, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> right? So again, this isn't some Johnny-come-lately policy of the NDP. This is something that uh, is finally gaining traction with a majority of Canadians. And that's just the truth. The majority of Canadians finally see this as the way to go. But this is something that for years and years and years has been talked about. When I talk to government employees, people who work uh, in the, the PMO's office, people who work um, as economists for the government, they say there is nothing that the Senate does that can't be done by either academia or a parliamentary committee. Uh, and we are paying lots and lots and lots of money for it. So just to keep that in mind, and I just wanted to share that story on the record because I've never had the opportunity to share that story, and I think it's a really good one. Nate? Yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I've, I've met a bunch of former New Democrat MPs and leaders that get offered the, uh, the golden handshake and say no, which I think speaks a lot, because you know, pretty sweet job, hey. One hundred and fifty thousand bucks a year until you're seventy-five. No actual responsibilities. But so many failed candidates get the job. It's, it's yeah. well, this is this, you want to talk about a slap in the face? Is you, you have somebody who runs for office, loses, and then gets put into the Senate. Anyways, there was a guy Harper put one of those same people into his cabinet from the Senate who had lost in the last election. Like Mr. Democrat, who then who then retired to run again, and then came back, and yeah, you know, again. it's just this. It's like, don't worry if you if the voters don't like you, we still love you. We'll pay you, and you can go around and do what you were going to do anyways, which is you know help us out. I mean, the, the Senate is what it is. I think there's a there's a question as to whether it's possible, right? You know, can voters be moved and motivated? And there's there are big, big and bigger issues facing our country right now. Yet there are is something in the conversation about renewing people's connection to the ballot box, feeling like it's not all just a rigged game for the other guy, and that someone's got your back. That, that the feeling like it doesn't have to be the way it's been is, for me, a very renewing conversation. It's a hopeful one, and it's one that we started with when I ran my little campaign in Northern D.C., saying that if, if you want to respect people, you got to just do it. You can't just say it in an ad. You have to show up. And it means doing sometimes difficult things. I, uh, like you guys did in coming, leaving your homes today <laughs> to come out here, it, uh, I really appreciate your time. I really do. Please uh, eat the sweets that are at the back of the room because what usually happens is if you don't, then I put them in my car and drive to the next place and they sit on the seat beside me. And lo and behold, when I get to London, I will eat 40 pounds worth of cupcakes. And I don't want to do that. It'll be so a very different Nathan. It'll be, it'll be a, a really, really <laughs> jazzed up, a bigger version of me. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is this is why I'm in politics, folks. I really enjoy this stuff. I enjoy hearing what's going on in your minds. I, I enjoy the tough questions and the insights. I think that's what it's about. I appreciate everybody who got online. That's kind of cool. Um, and uh, this guy, I get to meet a lot of candidates. I really do. I, I spend my time a fair amount on the road. You've got an exceptional one here. Uh, for someone this articulate, well-organized, and hardworking, congratulations. Now just go get them elected, because it wouldn't it be nice to have somebody that hardworking in Parliament, speaking on your behalf, being relevant and being known, because uh, I, I don't doubt when you get there, you will be. So thanks to all of you, and thanks for everything you came up today. Thank you. Thank you.